I believe in the creative force of chaos. You can either get up and look around and see how to make it better, or you can crumble. So the point is to make something even better out of this. If you don't have a manager who is absolutely vaccinated with the original culture of, say, the Ritz or the Four Seasons or something, then you've got a real problem. Because you can walk in and you feel, why does this place, when it's full, feel empty? <laughs> because there's none of the original force there, present, watching things. Welcome to the Hospitality Maverick podcast with me, Michael Tinkser. We at Hospitality Mavericks are here to inspire leaders to create heart-centered and profitable businesses from the inside out. The kind that both employees and customers love and support. Today's guest is one of my heroes. He will give you the feel of what it means to be a maverick. He dares to be different, change the world for shifts, and he's still setting extremely high standards to himself and the people around him. And he's been mentioned as the father of American cuisine. I was so lucky to get the time with legend Gerard Tower, who was the first celebrity and TV chef, and he started the movement of moving the spotlight from the front of house into the kitchen where the creator lives, the chef. We talk about his incredible journey from graduating as an architect from Harvard University to becoming head chef at Chess Penny, to launching stars in San Francisco and much more. We touch on some of the great people he worked with during his career, Wolfgang Puck, Anthony Pondain, Steve Ells, and many others. We'd also talk about what he would have liked to know from the outset of his career and his biggest mistakes and what he learned from them and how he get inspired. We talk about the pandemic and its impact on the hospitality industry and what Jeremiah thinks that will happen. He thinks that Silicon Valley should be a very big part of the solution, both with money and advice. He gives some stellar advice to leaders out there how to navigate and move forward. Lots of hope and huge amount of inspiration in this episode. But before you tune in, why not sign up to the Maverick Community Newsletter and get some great insights and leadership tools at hospitalitymavericks.com. We all need to go through this together, so happy to talk with you about your challenges, please book a chat with me on hospitalitymavericks.com. And don't worry, if you did not get all of this, there will be links in the show notes. Grab coffee, notebook, and enjoy. Welcome again to the uh, Hospitality Maverick podcast. And I'm really excited to uh, present you today's guest. Uh, He's a maverick. He dares to be different, that's for sure. And the game changer has changed the the industry and be part of a, a food revolution in the US a couple of times. And he's always setting that standard higher and higher when he does things. And uh, also, it has to be mentioned, he is the father of American cuisine in many's eyes and been part of a massive food revolution over there. So welcome to the Hospitality Maverick show, Jeremiah Tower. Thank you, Michael. It's a great pleasure to be on the show. Thank you for asking me. A great opportunity to be more of a maverick than ever. <laughs> I think you're going to kick it out of, out of the ballpark. But for people out there, because I can remember how I got introduced to you myself. I was browsing my Amazon uh, and then I thought there was this uh, documentary about a chef. I thought, who is uh, Jeremiah Towers? Who is he? And what is that about? And then I started with Anton, Anton Bourdain and uh, Wolfgang Puck and all these people, I thought, uh, and then I started looking into it and I thought you were very, uh, you know, instrumental for the big movement within restaurants in the U.S. as as we know it today. When when you started out, restaurant was not perceived as a, a thing that was on the television all the time and food programs and so on. You are probably one of the first celebrity chefs as well. Uh, which is now normal today. There's a lot of celebrity chefs out there. So can you just give people like a, a short intro of, of your journey and uh, what you had done on that? Well, I graduated from Harvard Architecture School and arrived in San Francisco. I was on my way to Hawaii to design underwater architecture. There was a big boo to all of that. So, of course, I was almost immediately broke. And some friends said, look at this ad in the newspaper. You know, there's a little restaurant in Berkeley called Chez Panisse that is looking for a chef. And I said, so what? That's got nothing to do with me. Um, But then I was down to my last $25. And I thought, well, you know, any job 
that's available has got a lot to do with me. So I went over and got an interview in Berkeley. And they said, okay, you've got the job. And I'd never worked in a restaurant before. I'd never actually had a job before. And on my first day, I was the, they said executive chef, but there were only two people in the kitchen. So that it was way more grand than my position. I was the chef of Chez Panisse. Um, was, yeah, I had one helper for lunch and dinner, six days a week. And then I did that for five or six years. And then I uh, opened uh, my restaurant Stars in San Francisco, which is the one that got all the attention and is the footage in the, in the documentary, The Last Magnificent, is so amazing on that Friday night. And then I've done restaurants in Singapore and Hong Kong and Manila. And now I'm sitting on the beach in Mexico. You look at the, you know, I think you know everybody should watch that documentary that has been a part of hospitality because there's a lot to learn and there's a lot of, you know, people involved in that. We have Wolfgang Puck, we have uh, Steve Ells from Chipotle, or the, 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 the former CEO of Chipotle and our chairman. You have Anthony Bourdain that was behind uh, helping you doing the documentary as well. And a lot of other people actually talking about the evolution of restaurants because sometimes we have to remember history sometimes to... Uh, understand where we're going to go in the future and uh, you say something in 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 the in the uh in the documentary i think that's really interesting in the in the start of the one of the first thing you say there is that i'm not human and people don't understand me sometimes where did that come from in your journey because you you definitely had a lot of success but you also gone through a lot of challenges well actually that was a quotation from my notebooks at harvard when i was 18 years old and full of drugs and for some reason, I gave it to the director of the documentary. I gave him a copy of my notebooks, and they picked up on that. They thought, and it made sense to me when I was 18 and full of masculine. Of course, I was an alien. <laughs> <laughs> like, like, like many are. Yes. <laughs> and during the, you know, we, we were just to stay a bit on your journey. Uh, during the, uh, you, you, so you, you, uh, you finish off with stars, you move on, you, you go to, to Mexico, where you also are now. And then, then you come back to New York which I think it's a very interesting move. You come back, it feels a bit like there was unfinished business a couple of years ago that has to be explored. Yes, I came back to take the job on a tavern on the green in New York, uh, mainly because it was, the ch I can't resist any kind of huge challenge. And that was the biggest challenge I could possibly imagine. An impossible job. Um, but we, we, I did turn it around a little bit, but it only lasted four months because the owner's, one day they said, we should like to be involved in the menu. And they said, is it true? I mean, is lamb white or dark meat? And I thought, uh-oh, I'm fucked. I'll, uh, <laughs> I can't do this anymore. <laughs> so so uh, with, with, with that in mind and all the things you've done, um, is there anything you wished you had known before you, you started your, your career, a long career in hospitality? I would love to have had a little formal training um, though I say that with, you know, hesitation, because if I'd had a lot of formal training, I never went to culinary school or anything. So uh, that first day at Chez Panisse was my first day cooking uh, professionally. But a little formal training would have made it easier. But then probably one of the great strengths of what we did at Chez Panisse is I had no idea what I couldn't do. You know, I mean, I had a vague idea. I knew the food had to be delicious. And I remembered the way things had tasted all my life, but it was a strength not to know what you can't do. You know, I mean, if I'd been to culinary school, I would have said, oh, no, we shouldn't be doing that. We shouldn't be doing that. We just did everything. Yeah, and I guess in a way you were not put in a, in a specific school, the French school or any other school of how to actually, you know, approach food and, and think about food. You actually approach food, which I think is quite interesting. And you can correct me here, like it's from what you have experienced yourself on your, your travels with your parents as a young child. And you try to explain that on a plate of food. Yes, exactly. Because, I mean, we travel all over the world and in great hotels and wonderful ships like the Elizabeth and the Queen Mary and everything. Um, and, and the menus were terribly grand. And I would, I would be bored, so I'd go in the kitchen, and the chef on the Queen Elizabeth adopted me and showed me how to cook things. You know, it was, it was quite wonderful. I should, I should mention about why Chez Panisse was so important. I mean, the wine spectator said that I, you know, struck the match that lit the fire of the revolution. And it was, Chez Panisse was a little French bistro 
the menus were in French, the wines were French. Um, and one day I ran out of ingredients that tasted anything like the, the real ones in France. And I said, but, you know, we're sitting in California and there's sort of cornucopia of things, not nearly the way it is today, but there were, you know, great oysters, great fish, wonderful lobsters. And I just said, okay, why not just do a California regional dinner? I've been doing French regional dinners. And one day I woke up and said, I'm going to do California. So the menu, we put the menu in English and did from then on, it was just, we cooked whatever was available in the market. And that uh, was a big change. Hard to imagine that that would be important because <laughs> today that's what everybody does. But no one before that, all the famous restaurants were red plush. Uh, you know, if you didn't have foie gras, you weren't serious, they would say. But of course, the foie gras came out of a can. And if you didn't have Dover sole, you weren't serious. But of course, the Dover sole has been frozen for six months. And fortunately, we couldn't afford Dover sole or foie gras or any of that stuff. So I just went, you know, to the local farmer's market in San Francisco and bought and cooked. Yeah, that's so interesting. As you say, like lots of restaurants are built around that philosophy today. If it's a, you're in Scandinavia or in Asia, you will have restaurants that primarily source things locally. And it also gives sense now from a environmental point of view and a footprint point of view that you don't serve food that's been transported across the, the, the globe. Talking about your career as well, what is the, one of your biggest failures and what did you learn from that? Oh, I think my biggest failure was definitely trying to open more than one restaurant, doing various stars. Um, and I didn't really, I, the model of how to do that so well, which is in, for instance, Daniel Ballou and all those people, wasn't really there then in 1990. It was after the earthquake, and I didn't want to close stars. I mean, the business went from $10 million in those days a year to, you know, almost nothing. So... I needed a million dollars to keep stars open for a couple of years and not get rid of anyone, not fire anyone, not lay anyone off. So I started taking on, okay, I'll do a stars in Seattle. I'll do a stars in Manila. I'll do a stars in Singapore. And I really didn't know how to do it. I'm no good at those multiple properties, managing them all myself. So not getting a group to do that. I'm not sure I could have gotten a group after the earthquake when San Francisco was on its knees. but that was my uh, biggest mistake. And I learned to not feel that I would be more of success if I have more restaurants. And that's very interesting because we've just gone through a time uh, pre-pandemic and we, we can touch on that in a moment where, you know, uh, a lot of operators have scaled a lot, you know, uh, if it's a, you know, change or it's restaurant groups, you know, it's, it's, it's all been about size and property. And, and that has now become a bit the uh, doomsday for many of them. The challenges they have now as they go into this is, is very big because either they, you know, they, they over leverage and they hadn't really thought about the, the impact. And, then, and I think it comes a bit back to, you know, sometimes happen things like the earthquake was in principle your pandemic as an operator. When I look at the, the documentary as well, how has the, you know, pandemic affected you as an, an, an individual and, uh, how do you see this uh, compared to the industry, which you've been part of so many years? You can almost say it's crumbled. Uh, you have, you look at a massive closure rate around the world. Uh, restaurants we enjoyed eating in will not be there after this. What, what has your experience been from, from where you are now and where you are in, at your point in the career? Well, I mean, in hospitality, restaurants and hotels, I mean, this is a world apocalypse. And I couldn't help but immediately thinking of the the Black Death and the plague in Europe when, you know, half the civilization was brought to its knees, but then it was followed by the Renaissance. So that's what we, the way we have to look at it. This is, thank God I don't have a restaurant or several because the more you have, the bigger the fall. But out of this, I believe in the, the creative force of chaos. You can either get up and look around and see how to make it better, or you can crumble. So the point is to make something even better out of this. I mean, that's a terrible thing to say to somebody who's lost one or five restaurants or more. But as you said earlier, I mean, it was almost, almost going to happen all by itself to the hospitality industry. In terms of, you know, I, I can walk into a restaurant or a hotel, and I can tell whether there's an owner or a culture of the owner, a great culture or not. 
as so many went part of a group, then there was sort of, you know, managers walking around who felt no part of it, who weren't part of the original concept of the, the original uh, inspiration of whoever started it. If you don't have a manager who is absolutely vaccinated with the original culture of, say, the Ritz or the Four Seasons or something, then you've got a real problem. Because you can walk in and you feel, why does this place, when it's full, feel empty? You know, because there's none of the original force there present watching things. Yeah, and it's so interesting when you bring up here, because I've had this conversation with people before where there has been maybe an acknowledgement that the, 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 the challenge of scaling is not getting the property or the menu scaled, it's actually getting that culture scaled and make sticky in, in, in that speed, you know, and, and that that's hard job because, you know, you probably spent years building the, the culture in, in stars. And I can remember there's a part where you say stars was like a rowboat where we all were pulling in the same direction and we had this, you know, everybody knew what to do at a specific time. It was like this high performance sports team or excellence on a different level. And I guess that that didn't come from day one. That was after evening, after evening, after evenings services where you learn to calibrate those things. It didn't take too long because we met the first payroll by only $2 in the bank. <laughs> so I sped it up as fast as I could. <laughs> but it, it meant 80, 90 hours a week uh, and being there all the time. I would walked in one morning and the person, it was, you know, we opened it at 12.30 and it was probably 11 o'clock or something in the morning. And I walked in and I walked up to the, the host behind the reception desk and I said, there's a light bulb off over table 25. And he said, how do you see that? You walked in and saw that right away. I've been here for an hour. And I said, my point exactly. <laughs> Where's your checklist, you moron? <laughs> because the owner has a checklist evolving, revolving in his or her head all the time. And that's the kind of culture you have to have for a big success. And that's super interesting you say that because you think about some of the, you know, uh, I have a background from McDonald's and that business is built on checklists. That's how the operation of the day-to-day -day run and the culture is that you know you've done all your things from your opening in the morning into the evening. And I've seen so many restaurants where I come in where there's no flow for the day. I, I call it the flow for the day, the checklist. What are your critical points, touch points you need to hit for being successful day out and day in? It's the consistency. It's a bit like a, a professional sports team. They have a schedule of what they do to win the, the championship. Right, right. I mean, there's a, there's a group in the United States called Hillstone that I admire very much because of its consistency and the culture of the staff is absolutely the owner who walked in. The owner walked in one day to one of the Hillstones and saw the flowers and called the manager over and said, you're fired. And the manager said, why? He said, if you can't look after flowers, you can't do anything. <laughs> when I see a restaurant with dirty windows, I think, oh God, you know, I'm not going to enjoy this at all. No, well, the devil is in the details. We we all know that from uh, running restaurants. So when we take this change we're going through as an industry, uh, and you are already touched on that this is maybe this is an opportunity. And uh, I love the, the expression you say, the only escape is change. You know, you, you have to keep on innovating to actually be relevant. And I, I guess we as an industry, I don't know what your view is, but... I felt a bit like we forgot that on the way we became, you know, very, it became more about managing things and it became about some things the industry were not really about. It was, it became about uh, investment, growth, but we forgot actually the restaurants is all about love for people, care for food and the customers. That's in principle the core of uh, hospitality. What is your view on that? Did we forget things a bit along the way? Oh, I think we forgot completely. I was in a hotel in Los Angeles a few months ago, well, actually now a year ago. And I walked up, came to the reception. There was one person behind the reception. It was actually a four season hotel. And the woman behind said, you'll have to wait. Well, yeah, yeah, I just arrived. I'm not expecting you to drop everything you're doing, but I would like to check in. I'm thinking to myself so silently, you know. And then she, I, five, it seemed like five minutes. It was probably three minutes later. I said, well, could you get someone to help to check me in? She said, I told you, and she pointed at me, I told you you had to wait. 
what? I mean, that is so far in the opposite direction from what hospitality is. And that was in, you know, one of the most serious properties in the United States. I was really flabbergasted. So yes, the training, training has all become about, you know, the group or profits or something, but the training should be, take that person, receptionist, take them to the Jour Saint for a night, <laughs> fly them to France, fly them to Italy, fly them to Hong Kong and show them what real hospitality is all about. I mean, if you've never experienced it, how would you possibly know what it is? It's like Chinese restaurants in Mexico. They've never eaten great Chinese food. How do you expect them to cook it? So I would always take my managers on trips to Europe or to New York or Los Angeles and show them what I thought was the best that the places had to offer and said, there it is. I took one of my sous chefs to Paris once to stay at the Creon to show them the breakfast service. We stayed two days and flew back. Yes, again, it's about setting that example or say, what is that we are, we are aiming for? And, uh, well, and, and, I, and if people have been experienced to say, how can you then feel it and, and, and do it and, and live it? Because you need a benchmark of your, what is perfect service. Well, once you've experienced it, um, then you know. And the pleasure that you get from receiving it. So that becomes your, your energy. Through your career, is there like, you know, you would say, is there like a myth you wanted to now? Because this is a reset moment, you know, the pandemic have brought something on the industry, as you said, maybe it's a positive, it's sad that, you know, maybe people are going out of business and so on. But is there like some myth you would like to kill about the, the profession? Because again, hospitality from when you look from the outside in, it's not maybe always the most attractive place from a Uh, for young people to go work we we definitely had here in the in the uk had some issues around talent talent and so on and there's a lot of myth about how it is to work in the industry is there anything you would like to kill on this podcast for people out there the myth that i would like to murder is the one that you know if you join hospitality it's the instant road to success and fame i was walking through cbs morning show with tony burdan when we were promoting the last magnificent and a young trainee or cook or anyway, a woman came up in her whites and her chef whites and said, how do I become a TV chef? And he turned to her and said, don't, and walked away. <laughs> I had pity on her. So I went, I went over to her and I said, what he really means is you have to become a great chef before you become something else. You know, I mean, if you want to be a great TV chef, you have to know how to be a chef first. I mean, There are some exceptions. Julia Child, she couldn't cook. She didn't have, she couldn't cook anything well. I mean, she was a terrible cook, but she was great on TV. There are exceptions, but if you're 19, I think you better become a chef and then go on to TV. Yeah, I think about the what you're saying there is the the power of have strong fundamentals in whatever you do and and raise your game all the way and and things things the universe will sometimes take care of the rest. You know, it's the effort you put in, the grit. What about the, you know, is there anyone out there? Do you have some people that has inspired you uh, either in the past, but maybe also inspires you right now uh, within or outside the industry? Is there anyone you're looking for inspiration? Well, I mean, I'd kill to go have lunch at Le Bernardin in New York again, you know. And when the Ledbury closed, I cried. <laughs> but in the past, I mean, the people who influenced me the most were Elizabeth David, who was a great pal. Um, Richard Olney, who did, you know, The Good Cook. And, and I suggest that anybody read Simple French Food from Richard Olney. I mean, the, the inspiration, the energy, the love, the passion is on every page. And it's easy to read. And it's a brilliant book. And James Beard, because he helped me in my career so much. Uh, he loved to be a mentor and make telephone calls and get people jobs and that kind of thing. And in the past, apart from the introduction to the chapters in Escoffier's Le Guide Culinaire, I would say the, the Fenam Point, Gastronomie, the cookbook, is one that is still hugely inspirational. I love Fenam Point because he made his staff, his kitchen, cook one dish for a year before he would allow it on the menu. It was the most famous dish of all. It was a gratin of crayfish tails. He made them cook it every day, and then they had to eat it for staff lunch. <laughs> you know, crayfish and cream and cognac. <laughs> yeah, that, that. 
Yeah, yeah, even that you can get tired of. <laughs> oh God, I'm surprised it took him a year to get it. I would have taken a week to get me, you know, so I'd stop eating the damn thing. So those are my inspiration points. That's just some super. And again, it's it also there's like a, there's a lot of history again uh, connected to them because I had a conversation the other day, and I think I think you've been talking about the same in the the documentary as well, and you said on a couple of other podcasts I listen to you talk about like sometimes you need to understand where you, where you come from to understand where we are going. And I think this is the period that's a lot about that as well and finding inspiration in history as well. Because as you said, you know, the even though the, the plague sounds like a, a very scary thing, in principle, we have a modern version of that going on right now across the world. Yes, we do. If you had to sit with a, Jeremiah, if you had to sit now down with a, a crystal ball and had to predict where the... Uh, the restaurant industry will go or the hospitality industry will go within the next 18 months to three years. What is a, what do you see that's going to happen? Well, I, would, I can see what I would like to happen and what the, the engine of energy to get it going. I mean, I was looking at Nations Restaurant News, the American publication, and in the USA, there are over a million restaurants, 20 million employees, $900 billion annual revenue, uh, 10% of the workforce, 5% of the GDP. And hotels worldwide, there are 700,000 that generate $570 billion. Now, we're talking $1.5 trillion here in hospitality income around the world. Think of all the technology that we use and all the chips we've bought, the computers, the iPads and everything. So I want to say, as I read in CNBC, they did a report that said between May 21st, 2020 and mid-May, billionaires in the U.S. gained $434 billion more dollars for themselves. Bezos got $34 billion. Zuckerberg, $25 billion. And that was in uh, you know, three or four months. And now it's December. God knows what those figures are. So my point is to Silicon Valley, it's payback time. Not just money, but we want your brains. You know, this looking at this tidal wave of horror, you know, coming at us in closures. You know, we need an Einstein moment. We need the moment that Jeff Bezos thought up, created the idea for Amazon. That, you know, who the guy sitting in a garage doing Facebook or Google or something. We need that moment again. And they owe us big time. It's payback time. So, you know, we want the, the money and the brains and to get together a force of people like yourself and podcast. And I want to, I hesitate to say do, do a UN because, you know, it seems like a very limp body at these days. But, you know, you know what I mean? We need to put that all together and get a force of people with the money and the brains, the best brains in the world, because hospitality is not going to go away, but we don't want it to be something that's you know, gray, boring, horrible, uh, limping along. We need to be better than ever. Yeah, and, I, and I, it's so interesting. I totally agree. My mom always says, and she said to me when this started, we have to remember, Michael, and you know I've always said that, that you know, people are always going to eat and they're going to die. So there's going to be jobs for the restaurateur and the undertaker. So it's just about <laughs> how you serve that food and you meet them there. And again, you know, how you, you evolve around that. And I think you're right. There is a, this is the moment in time in global, from a global point of view, where we need to come together in, in, in a kind of think tank or what you're saying there to actually to solve these problems, because there are some systemic problems within the industry, pandemic or no pandemic, that it shows against that we are... We are not robust enough to to go through things, and like you see, uh, tech companies that are making a lot of money. You said that um, in, in 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 what you just said that I think it was really good way of positioning. We need some help. Uh, what is it that we have done for them if we had to turn it around that they should come to our rescue now? In Silicon Valley, and the billionaires I was mentioning, they've made all a lot of their money off the hospitality industry. I mean, th think of the technology, the reservation systems, the menu creating systems. I mean, all the communication, all the hospitality, all the travel that goes in tourism through hospitality. So that's given them 
what have they taken from us? 50 billion, 100 billion dollars? So why can't they, if Bezos and Zuckerberg, between them, just gained somewhere between 50 and 100 billion dollars since the pandemic started, personally gained that money, they could put a billion dollars into every country in the world, you know, that has a big hospitality industry or did have, and say, here you go, you know, may the best brains win. Super interesting thinking, and I haven't heard about that kind of approach before, but I, I think you're right. That's what needed now. And uh, because uh, if, uh, you mentioned before we went on, you were also on your way into the second lockdown. And we are in a second lockdown here in the UK, and it has tremendous uh, impact on you know the hospitality sector. Uh, and you know, I don't know who will open and will not open. Even you know, the the ones you thought that was uh, home safe are not home safe anymore. So I think that it really needs a a deep dive uh, in in a way to find out how we operate as we go forward. Because again, uh, well, so it's who who's going to invest in businesses that's lying on their knees now? That's that's the big question that's going around. So I think you are absolutely right. The ones who got super rich off of us. I mean, it was a partnership. We needed all that technology. And, you know, we paid through the nose for it. How much does a POS system in a 150-seat restaurant cost these days? Hello? I mean, you know, Microsoft, hello. If we uh, look a bit about, you know, if uh, we look a bit, the, the leaders is out there running these uh, businesses, the owners, the operators, the, the managers, what kind of uh, top advice can you give them, uh, Jeremiah, uh, compared to when you, your life experience in restaurant, how you see it from the outside now? What should they do right now to feel they are moving forward and not backwards in this? I would retrain everybody. I mean, these, they're all, who knows? It's not about, of course, it's about wearing masks. Of course, it's wiping down the chairs and the tables. Of course, it's, you know, ventilation systems and the way they have in hospital. It's all of that, of course, but that's just a very small beginning, hugely important, but that's not what's going to reopen the hospitality around the world. It's not what's going to save all the restaurants that were great and wonderful before. I, I would but retrain. I mean, have faith that you're going to reopen, find a way to reopen, and then make sure that my experience at that hotel in Los Angeles I told you you have to wait. Never happens again. The point is, it stars. We never said no. I would always say yes, and then turn around and think, "Oh my God, what the fuck am I going to do now?" You know. <laughs> but, but that's the point. There are no no's in hospitality. I mean, there are moments of panic after you turn around so they can't see the frown on your face as you're madly trying to think, "What in God's name am I going to do?" So we one Friday night at Stars. We were packed. There was an hour and a half wait, and there were, you know, 50 people waiting on the wait list. Some people came in and said, I said, I was on, so I, it was so busy that I jumped over to the front door to help out uh, because they were getting a lot of shit. And I, you know, they would get less if I was standing there. So I did. And these people came in and said, you know, we'd like a table. And I, I explained why they couldn't have one. I said, you know, if I want to get you a table, I'd have to build you one. And they went, Fine. I went, yes. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> so I went downstairs and found it with two bus boys and we screwed a you know table base and top together and brought it up and plunk and it was uncovered. It was just, you know, the plastic cover. And I plunked it down in the middle of all these people milling around. I said, I've got your table, but there's no place to put it. And they said, What about right here where I'd put the table? Which of course is right by the reception stand. I mean with 50 people milling around, impossible. I said, I'd have to put it. I said, okay. <laughs> so we got a tablecloth and some chairs and we set them up there. And I said, this is going to be the worst evening you've ever, ever spent in a restaurant. And they said, we have a table. It's stars. We're looking forward to it. So I personally, there were no waiters to look after them. So I waited on table. I'm a terrible waiter. Um, but with the bus boys, we managed and they had a time that, you know, they'll never forget. I certainly haven't forgotten. So that was how to say yes. Yeah, that's a great example of, you know, doing uh, hospitality in the moment and, uh, you know, you know, doing what it needs to be done. And they, they, they probably still talk about that evening, in, in, uh, even though if you, if you 
don't have contact to. That's like you know one of those unique evenings where that, that you went up above and beyond for them. That that's some really good advice, uh, Jeremiah. What about the um, what about people's you know. How do they keep themselves sane in all this? How do they take care of themselves? What what would your advice be? Because you have a lot of life experience. How do they actually make sure that they keep mental sane in all this? I'm not sure because I think I'm going around the bend right now with this pandemic. I mean, stir crazy. And it it's such an emotional time. Uh, I think it's very rough. I I can't remember something happening to me that I couldn't take charge of and try and make better. But this one, this is different. I mean, you feel there's almost nothing you can do except on a very personal level. But if you haven't got a job, you know, and there aren't any jobs, what are you going to do? You lost a job before, you go find another one. This one is very rough. In the in California, I think I think they're stopping unemployment. I mean, I think they've stopped it or are stopping it. So if unemployment stops in the U.S., what are people going to do? I don't really know. I think, you know, you go, you start at the lemonade stand. That was an American myth that kids in the suburbs would put a little lemonade stand outside, you know, and I think cooking at home, selling, I mean, it's, that's where it'll all start again. Not much money in it, but uh, the thing is not to stop. We don't have to conquer it right now, but we don't have, we don't want to surrender. Uh, I have a very good friend of mine. He said uh, that the only way out of this is that there's, there's a couple of things. It fits with you say you care for other people and keep on talking and doing things and do whatever you need to do to keep yourself moving. And, and if you're doing something that you thought you never would do, it doesn't matter as long as you are, you are cooking or serving coffee somewhere or lemonade, as you say, you know, you just so you, you feel that you're ta- taking so much charge as you can of the situation, because that's the, that's the big problem is your circle of influence is gone. Yes. And it, otherwise, if your brain stops and you stop and, and you sink into self-pity, then, then you are a victim. I'm writing a book about all the travels I've done and all the meals I've had, uh, and especially the ones where that you know make a p- political and cultural point about what's happening to us today so i've got my brain working i certainly lost a lot of money <laughs> and opportunities with this pandemic everything was postponed postponed was my favorite word about six months ago but i think now postponed is now spelled cancelled <laughs> you know? uh, but it's super, it's, it's also what you mentioned before what happens when you know we think about the the, the people that works uh, in uh, in our industry, when they hit, you know, in unemployment, then they have unemployment benefit. And there's all these government schemes on all across the world. And they are they are running out because the government can't keep on subsidizing. And many of these people are very close, even when they have a job to the curve, because hospitality is maybe not one of the highest paid profession in the world. And I guess that's one of the worries that is around when I talk with leaders in the industry is that our talent is almost maybe it's going to be hurt so much they never will come back to the industry because they ended up in a very difficult situation. That can be managers, it can be frontline employees. that's just struggling getting food on the table now. I think that in the U.S., for, for sure, that the American public has got to learn to spend more money on food when they go out. I mean, restaurants in the States are so cheap compared to the rest of the world. And Americans, you know... I've been spoiled for so long. I mean, gone are the days when petrol was 50 cents a gallon. But somehow the culture that thinks you should never spend more than $40 on a meal or $15 on a main course, that's still very much in the United States. And that's got to stop because the restaurants, were we were getting to a point anyway where we couldn't keep going, as you said. Apart from the pandemic, the hospitality was facing a huge crisis. There were too many restaurants. The margins were getting smaller and smaller and smaller. So it had its own pandemic built into it. And, uh, you know, and, and, it's, and, it, and you're, you're absolutely spot on because it would just have come slower than it, it's come here. So actually, we, were, we, we had to deal with these systemic issues already, as you mentioned before. Uh, on the uh, on the end of the the conversation, Jeremiah, is there anything besides uh, you want uh, you know Silicon Valley to become a bit active in reliving the industry? Is there any one thing you want to 
to leave the the audience with something they should think about, something they should do, something they should reflect about, uh, something that they can use this time for now. I'm just going to correct you when you said we want a bit of help from Silicon Valley. No, 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 no. We want $100 billion from them to put you know, a billion in 100 countries and say, this is a competition. May the best brains come up with uh, our future and start building it now. I think we need for everyone as much inspiration right now as possible. That's why I mentioned, for cooks anyway, Richard Only's Simple French Food. I'm rereading for the first time in a few years Alice B. Toker's cookbook. It is so brilliant. And she said, the best cooking comes out of the choice and respect of ingredients. No news there. But what I saw happening in the United States, and of course around the world, is everybody copied everybody, everybody's dish and plating. She said, exaggeration is not admissible. And flavors are not amalgamative. In other words, I had a salad the other day at a wonderful seaside restaurant here. And it was, you know, jicama and fresh leeches and roasted bell peppers and berries and on and on and on. You know, there were 16 ingredients. Each one was beautifully done. But like when you mix 16 colors together, you get brown. That's what was happening to the food that was being plated in the United States and Australia and England as well. You know, everyone was copying everyone and thinking that if three ingredients were wonderful, then, you know, six, 12, 18 must be even better. Huge mistake, huge mistake. So we actually, the restaurant business around the world was starting to lose its customers, lose customers who loved them trusted them. Remember when food started to get, you know, six inches, eight inches tall on the plate and the customer was saying, well, what do I do with it? You know, it's going to end up in my thousand dollar Armani suit. <laughs> you know, I don't know how to eat this thing. And I, th- I heard that, you know, in, in restaurants, I don't know how to eat this. Well, what an impossible situation to put people in. And we did it. And we did it over and over again. In that salad, they could have taken the berries and made a, a vinegar with them. They could have made a lychee vinegar and toss the salad in that, you know. So my advice to the chefs is, and hoteliers is get out of your head and back into your mouth. That's, that's a super advice because you, you are so right when you think about going a cup, you know, just before the pandemic as well, where you went in and, you know, the food was similar from place to place. They're using the same plates, almost the decoration. Uh, there was like... A, a, Thinking about stars was quite a unique place when you you see that. I've never been there, just seen the, the pictures, but you can see there was it was built for a, a specific atmosphere where it's just this cookie cutter approach to food and uh, hospitality experience that we we need to get away from and actually you know come back to what hospitality always has been about. You know, it's it's about serving and feeding people. People may not know is that stars there was a new menu every day for lunch and dinner. They- Menus change twice a day. Now that forces you to uh, be creative, but not so creative that people would say, you know, what is this? I don't, what are all these flavors? What, how can I eat this? What is it? I think, you know, any chef who wants to see what the future will hold, go to Barcelona and go to some of the, the market there and go and eat at some of the best fish restaurants. A piece of fish caught that morning olive oil, essence of lobster, shell or prawns, uh, and one veg, a little baby fava beans, and that's it. Absolute heaven. So, Jeremiah, thank you so much for taking the time uh, and uh, coming on the show. And, uh, you know, there's no doubt about you definitely created, you know, you're taking it down memory lane, but also you made it very clear that we need to come together. We need to have some great thinking to get out of this. And we, we also need some help for that. Uh, some some big help from from the Silicon Valley people or any other that wants to help to, to rebuild this industry because it's essential for our society and communities that hospitality stays and thrive and survive because that's where we, we meet and greet. And then also the importance of, you know, go out and do something that's spectacular. Don't try to copy what others do so we all become looking similar and bland and brown in a way. So thank you so much for coming and I'm sending 
all the power and energy you need to get through to the, to the other side. Thank you, Michael, and I'm returning it to you. Jeremiah, you are Maverick. Thank you for sharing your incredible wisdom. I really appreciate it. Some great thinking in here for all leaders, no matter industry. If you enjoyed today's podcast, please share, rate it, review it, or subscribe to one of our channels. Tune in next time for another interview. And in the meantime, find out more about us and subscribe to our community and download free leadership tool at hospitalitymavericks.com. Please also join the Game Changer Facebook group if you want to be the forefront what progressive leaders are up to in the hospitality industry. If you did not get all of this, don't worry, there will be links in the show notes. Thanks for listening and be maverick.